part of that's definitely going to be to develop your character as much as possible, to dispense with those parts of you that are unworthy. And then maybe, if you're fortunate, and you do that carefully, then happiness will descend upon you from time to time. And that's the best you've got. And then also perhaps during sorrowful times, or worse, evil times, the fact that you've strengthened your character and that you're aiming at the highest that you can conceptualize, that'll give you the moral fortitude to endure without becoming corrupted during those times. And to be someone who can be relied upon in a crisis. There's, there's, a, there's an aim. You know, one of the things I've told my audience is, the young guys take to this a lot. I said, you should be the strongest person at your father's funeral, right? Well, that's something to aim for. It, it's a transition, a generational transition. And it means that, well, all the people around you are suffering because of their loss. They have someone to turn to who can illustrate by their behavior that the force of character is sufficient to move you beyond the catastrophe. And it, you need that. And that's a great thing to, that's a great thing to hypothesize as your aim. And happiness just evaporates as, as irrelevant in light of that sort of conceptualization. So when you are the strongest person at your father's funeral, and I just buried my father last yeah. month, yeah. so I, it strikes home that when you say that, should there be joy around that realization? Not happiness. Happiness is like the fizzly bubbles in a, in a, in a carbonated beverage. Flighty, flighty, they tickle your tongue, but they go away. Is there a deeper joy? Because so many... Well, you, there's, at least, there's at least the sense that you've taken something that could be very much like hell and made it far better than it could have been. And there's also the fact that, you know, if you deal with, if, you're, if you've matured enough, let's say, to deal with the catastrophe of loss and death, that you can also be the rallying point for the remnants of your family and pull them together at a moment of crisis. And that's, that's a payoff to some degree for the loss. And I mean, I've seen this in families who've dealt with death properly. The remainder of the family pulls together, you know, they become, they become more integrated. And it's not complete compensation for their loss, but it's not nothing. And it certainly beats the alternative where everyone fractionates because everyone's too weak to cope with the catastrophe and, and everything dissolves. So how do you actually become the strongest person at your father's funeral? What are the steps? And does it, is it always about being mission driven? Well, the mission, is, the mission is the improvement of your character, the constant improvement of your character. And I think a lot of that's done in dialogue with your conscience. It's like your conscience is always telling you. Socrates said this thousands of years ago. Your conscience is always telling you what you shouldn't be doing. And one of the things Socrates said was what discriminated him from the run-of-the-mill person, and why perhaps we still know of him so many thousands of years later, was that when his conscious, conscience told him not to do something, he didn't do it. He stopped saying the things that he shouldn't have been saying, and he stopped doing the things he shouldn't have been doing. And that's a start, you know. That, that's a discipline, I would say. That's the ability to follow a certain kind of intrinsic discipline. And, and maybe that's merely the cessation of evil. And that's not exactly the same as the pursuit of positive good. Let's say you haven't got there yet, but that's a start. You, you clear away the obstacles from your vision by ceasing to engage in those activities you know to be wrong. And then the world starts to lay itself out in more pristine form. And then maybe you can start to apprehend what would be positively good instead of merely not wrong. I mean, not wrong is a good start. That's right. you know, the, the biblical... <laughs> corpus is structured in that way to some degree, at least from a Christian reading. The first rule is follow the damn rules, right? Get yourself together. Here's some rules, 10 of them, 100 of them. Follow them. You discipline yourself, right? You, you make yourself a reasonably morally respectable individual. And so now you're not blinded as much by your own proclivity for uselessness and malevolence. And then you can integrate all that. You can integrate all those rules. 
and and that's the beginning of the development of character and then you can then you can embody you can embody the union of the rules it's something like that and that's the, that's the, that's that ultimate nobility and character like in 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 the christian corpus christ is represented let's think about this psychologically as the perfect individual right well, just think about that as the psychological re representation. And that's the person who's taken a disciplinary structure and, and integrated it into a personality that acts that out properly in the world. And, and, and it's not merely rule-bound either, because you have to follow the rules, but you also have to be part of the process that generates new rules when it's necessary. And so you take that onto yourself, too, as an additional responsibility. And that makes you more than a blind avatar of authority and stops you from being rigid. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you look at a, 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 a medieval cathedral, one of the things you'll see, for example, is a representation of the sky, the dome of the sky. And maybe you'll see an a representation of Christ on the, on, the, on the peak of the dome. And think about that as a representation of the ideal individual speaking only psychologically. It's like there's something of cosmic importance about that. That's... That's what you're aiming at, is that perfection of yourself. And that'll keep you busy for your entire life. And, and, <laughs> and it'll do no harm, right? It'll, it'll, it'll make you better. It'll make your family better. It'll make your community better. And it'll give you... And it, it's psychologically meaningful. So there's all that. It helps you withstand suffering and, and, and disperse malevolence. But it's also extraordinarily practical, because if you become a better person, then you're, you start to be good for things, you know? You can fix problems. You can handle a funeral. You can handle a difficult situation, you know? And so it's not only that it's psychologically meaningful to pursue the highest of goals and the development of your character, but it's also the best possible thing that you can do practically here and now in the material world to make it less terrible than it might otherwise be. Are your personal goals always going to be aligned with the needs of society, the needs of humanity? Well, that's, that's a trick, you know? It's... 